Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We're very excited to be here with Adam. Adam, Chire, how do you pronounce your last name, Adam? Chire. Chire. Okay, I want to make sure I didn't mess it up. So Adam is not only the co-founder of Siri, which we all know and use today, um, he also is a founding member of Change.org and the co-founder of Viv Labs, and he's the vice president of R&D at Samsung Mobile. So on top of all of that, he's a magician. And so we have him here today to share us some lessons on entrepreneurship from his experience and also mix it up and make it fun by incorporating some magic. Great. Uh, thanks a lot for having me. Um, I love to talk about entrepreneurship. It's, it's really a passion in my life and it's, it's been the most rewarding experience for me. I've worked at big companies, I've worked at small companies, I've worked in research labs, commercial ventures. But for me, the startup is the greatest engine of creation in the world. That, that for me is how you actually go out and, and change the world. So I'm gonna uh, talk about my top three lessons for entrepreneurs, um, distill down from four, I've actually done four uh, successful companies. So it's, as mentioned, uh, Siri, which sold to Apple, is now on more than a billion and a half devices. Um, Viv Labs was a successor company to Siri, uh, sold to Samsung about three years ago, and will be on probably a billion devices in just a few years. Change.org is um, the world's largest petition platform with about a third of a billion members today. And Sentient was a machine learning uh, venture. It's not as well known, um, but it's um, done some important work in the field. So today's talk, I have note cards, uh, is called The Magic of Entrepreneurship by me. And the idea of this talk is that I'm going to teach three lessons, but I'm not going to just tell you about them. I'm going to try to show you um, an example of how the lesson is applied. So either I'll tell you how I did it for one of my companies, or I'm going to have an exercise for you to try practicing the lesson yourself um, so that you can, um, uh, you know, put it to good use and actually remain, remember it. And each lesson and each exercise is based on a magic trick around one of my three companies. So with that, lesson number one. So the first thing, as you know, is you need an idea, a big idea. Um, you need an idea that's ambitious enough because if you do something just incrementally better, big companies are going to be able to do that better than you can. I'm gonna try this screen share so you can actually see my slides. Um, and so the idea is it has to be ambitious and for a big market. It's gonna take you a lot of effort, a lot of time. You could do something small, but why not? Might as well go um, and try to do something that will change the world for maybe a billion people. The second thing is that it's not enough to just tell people how, you know, what your idea is going to be. You need to show them and you need a magical demonstration, something that, um, you know, I, I say magicians and entrepreneurs are really the same. Both an entrepreneur and a magician imagine an impossible future. And then, because if it's too easy, if it exists already, um, you know, that's, that's too easy. So you need to be ambitious. You imagine impossible future, and then you figure out the math and the science to make it actually happen in the real world. I mean, when we started Siri, um, no one thought back in the mid 2000s that you'd be able to have a mobile device that you could just talk to and ask it to do things for you uh, using language and conversation. It seemed like magic and yet we made it uh, occur. And the third factor, the third lesson, third, third uh, point uh, of this lesson number one is once you have an idea, once you have a demonstration, you can prove to the world why it's gonna be better, you need to be very clear why is it better than the competition? So I'm gonna tell you how we did that with Siri. Um, now remember, we started Siri in about 2007. So at the time, 
Google was king of the world in the technology world, and the iPhone had just come out, and people had apps. And everyone's like, oh, I've got Google, I've got apps. Why do I need something different? And so I built a prototype that would show why Siri was better, and I said it would be better in three ways. Number one, when you put in a keyword into a search engine back in 2007, it just gave you links. It doesn't give you answers. And you had to click and browse and scroll. And I wanted something where you could just say, I want to know this. And there was the answer, number one. Number two, I wanted to be able to refine my queries conversationally. So maybe I'd say, how about tomorrow? What about the next day? Oh, and less than $300. And it would keep context and remember over time. You, you couldn't do that with a search engine or with an app. And number three, I wanted Siri to be able to help me with multiple tasks at the same time. So if you're planning an evening out, you want you know, to arrange a dinner and a movie. But if you choose this reservation, well, then that only certain movies work. If you choose this movie and this time, only certain restaurants reservations work. Very difficult to do with, with apps and search engines. So I built a prototype. And uh, I'm going to show you, uh, if you'd like to see, the very first version of Siri, the prototype that we built. I carry it around with me everywhere in a little box. I know it doesn't look like uh, Siri, but this was a paper prototype. Um, you know, a lot of time before you do the software version, you can start a paper prototype. Let me uh, zoom in again so you can see. Now, I want you to see all the cards are different. Uh, I want you to see that they're mixed up in a no special order. We're going to mix them in, in all sorts of different ways. Great. Now, uh, like most magic tricks, I need someone to help me pick a card. So Ariel or Michelle, could you choose uh, someone, just unmute them so that I can hear them and I'll tell them how we're gonna pick a card. Uh, Michelle, can you pick somebody? Yep. Um, I'm just gonna randomly select somebody, so. Great. <laughs> Let's go with Bill Dank. Will you select a card? Okay, Bill, here's how it's going to work. I'm just gonna move my finger like this anywhere over the deck. And when you want me to stop, we'll stop. And you can change your mind at any point. So just say stop whenever you like. Stop. Right here? Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna zoom out the cards a little bit so you can you know, get the exact card you want. Uh, you know, say stop or wherever. Good here, stop. here, here. Yeah, that's good. All right, let's 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 take out the card. Rent. Actually, I uh, took out two. That's that's okay. We we can do two cards. That's that's fine. All right. Now, I have you know we we had all of these different cards mixed up. You chose any card. We had shuffled the deck. I have no idea what card you chose, uh, or cards. And even you don't know what card you chose. So what we're going to do is let's ask Siri. Now, let me show you how to do that. With Siri, as you know, uh, you have a button. And on the back of every card, they put a little button. So all I have to do is lean forward and say, doo -doo. no, I'm, I'm just kidding. We, we didn't actually implement speech recognition in our first paper prototype of Siri. But we did do what's called natural language understanding. I can type questions to Siri and it will answer them. So let me show you. Now your card could be a club, heart, spades, or diamond. So it could be a red card or a back black card. Let's ask Siri. Siri, what color is the card? I can't speak, I have to type. So color, C-O-L-O-R. Now you chose any card from this shuffle deck, but Siri says you chose a red card. All right, maybe, who knows? Now, 50-50 chance, red or black, but I want to know what number you chose. Number, N-U-M-B-E-R, number. 
And Siri says, you chose a nine, a red nine. Okay, maybe. Now, if you chose a red card, you might have chosen a heart or a diamond. Let me ask, Siri, is it hearts? H-E-A-R-T-S, hearts. And Siri says, oh, no, you chose, Bill, a diamond, according to Siri. Now, this is not artificial intelligence. I mean, it's just a bunch of cards shuffled up. But if it were, uh, this is all going to work out. And if I were to ask the match, the M-A-T-C-H, Siri is saying that you chose the red nine of diamonds. The match would be the other red nine. The red nine of hearts. And Bill, that means out of the shuffle deck, you told me to choose the red nine of hearts. Now investors, customers, Google cannot do this. And apps can't do this because Google gives you links. I've shown you Siri is answering every question that I've asked and, and Bill chose what question, what answer to choose. Um, I've also shown you I can refine it like a conversation, is it a red card, is it a diamond? And it works and it keeps context. But uh, I also said Siri could help you choose, uh, do multiple tasks at the same time. And Bill, we actually chose two cards where you selected from the deck. So let me show you how to solve two problems at the same time. Uh, this was the uh, color pile. Um, so if I ask, Siri, what color is Bill's other card? Siri says, oh, the other card is black. If I say, what was the number of his card? He says, an ace, you picked a black ace, maybe. Now, if it's black, could be clubs or it could be spades. Is it spades? Oh, it is indeed spades and every, uh, card in the deck has exactly one match. So if Siri says you chose the black ace of spades, then the match must be the black ace of clubs. And that means that you chose the second card with the black ace of spades. So there you go. Um, there's an example of how, um, when we were creating Siri, now we didn't do it in real life with paper. Um, we did it with software. But we literally had exactly the same idea um, where we needed to show the world why Siri was going to be better than Google or than an iPhone. We, were, we needed to have differentiation and really have kind of a, a killer demonstration um, uh, of our technology. So that, that's kind of lesson number one, have a big idea, a magical idea bring it to life through a prototype, and then show everybody at least three ways of why your solution hits a pain point that can't be solved today using today's technology. Uh, one other thing, so usually as my friend uh, Steve Jobs used to say, um, one more thing. So we didn't just, just have three ways that theory would be better. We added a fourth one more thing way, uh, which is personality. Um, so, uh, you know, when Siri came out, people would ask it, not just functional questions like what's the weather and set a timer, but they would say, you know, questions, funny things, uh, tell me a joke, et cetera. So I've seen the logs when I was running Siri at Apple. Um, do you know, uh, Ariel, what the number one most popular kind of funny question you or kids or people might ask Siri. Any, any ideas, Dario? Mm, just the weather. <laughs> What's the, no, no, that's a functional. I'll give you actual information. But uh, sometimes people would ask Siri things like, uh, you know, what is, you know, or how many uh, woodchucks could a woodchuck chuck? And just to see <laughs> what it would say. Those are kind of the funny things. So do you know what the number one most popular one is? Tell me. Any guesses? All right. So the number one most popular question, it's always about relationship. Mm -hmm. So number two was, will you marry me? The number one most popular request is Siri. Do you love me? 
<laughs> and we, we actually put all of those types of things in our first prototype. Let me show you. Uh, let's cut the deck to a new spot, start fresh. Uh, we just asked Siri, do you love me? Uh, I have to type love, L-O-V-E. And Siri says, she loves me. She gives me her heart. So there's, there's another thing that we built into Siri, the personality being able to, to make it kind of fun and funny for people. Okay, entrepreneurs, that's lesson number one. Uh, now uh, we're going to go on to lesson number two. So lesson number two is finding the right founding team, and we'll come to this. So the idea is you have your big idea, you're ready to go out and start a company, but one of the issues is you, you can't do it all by yourself. You're going to need help. Oh, sorry. Different people for a founding team, that's actually rather large, but you're going to need four different skill sets in your founding team. So what are those four skills? The four skills are you're going to need a visionary, someone who understands why you're doing it in the long, with the big picture, right? They're going to know how over time you're going to win in a particular market, what problem you're going to solve, the visionary. The second skill you'll need is the marketeer. So it's not enough to have this big vision. You need a way to compellingly communicate it to the world, to your employees, to potential customers, to investors. You need really a salesman or a marketeer who communicates that vision well. Number three, you need a product person. A product person can take a big long-term vision and break it down into priorities and saying, we're gonna do this first, this second, this third, and here's why. Uh, and doing that, you're going to build a roadmap. Uh, and then finally, number three, you need, uh, number four, you need a builder, someone who can take that roadmap and uh, deliver it. So uh, with that, we have an exercise. People will often ask, actually, before I start the exercise, and this exercise is going to be based on change.org because change.org is all about, um, you know, people interacting with each other. So the question is, how do you find the right uh, set of people to join your team? Um, so you need to go to meetups, you need to go to uh, venture studios, things of that sort. Um, and the goal is to know what skills you're great at and to always be looking and networking for those other skills to complete the picture. So we're going to have an exercise on how to find those, those candidates that you need. Uh, it's super important. If you don't have the right founding team, it'll all fall apart. Your whole company can, can come apart. Uh, so here's how we're going to do it. And here, we're going to use a little bit of money because this is, actually, I'm going to get back my, my sheet so we can remember the skill. So think of all of these uh, cards like candidates. And what you need to do is, sure, you're going to look at their references, but chemistry and intuition of, is this person someone I can work with, is equally important. So I'm going to show you how this game works. Uh, and um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to take the stack of candidates, uh, and I'm going to look for a visionary. So what you do is take each card, drop it down. Let me um, make sure I'm, let's see, I'm going to share the screen overhead cam again so you can see. So you're going to take each candidate and say, oh, is this, is this the visionary? No, it doesn't feel right. Is this the visionary? No, not, not, not quite yet. Is this the visionary? Now, this, this is the one. I'm sure this is the right visionary. And when you make your choice, you need to lock it in with some money, and you drop the deck 
on top. So I've chosen out of all these candidates uh, a particular person for a particular candidate for a visionary. So uh, Ariel, could you choose someone else who's going to help me uh, choose the marketeer? Michelle, I don't think I can, so I think you need to pick someone. I okay. will pick, how about Zena? Hi, Zena. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm, unfortunately, you can't feel the cards yourself, but I'm going to just start dropping down each candidate. You're focused on marketeer. You're looking for the right marketeer. Uh, and we've got money on this. If we don't choose the right candidates, we lose all our money, the company falls, it's over. So this is serious. So I'm gonna start dropping down cards uh, like that. And wherever you want, you're gonna say, stop, that's the one, all right? But think about it, get the right candidate. This is for marketeer. Are you there, Zena? Can we hear you? Yes, no? Oh, I might need to pick somebody else. <laughs> oh, all right, well, why don't, uh, Ariel, why don't you just say stop when you like? Okay, sounds good. All right, stop. Not just, stop? Oh, all right. Not just yet? We're gonna, uh, you want me to go back? <laughs> sure, yeah, More? we can keep going. We can keep going. All right. All right, but we need cards for the others too, so. Okay. Sorry, my connection's so slow, so everything's delayed. Yeah. And stop, anytime. Okay. We've done all, we've gone through a lot stop. of candidates here for marketing. We can stop. stop. Okay, so we're gonna lock it in with the bill, drop the rest on top. All right, we need now a, uh, product person. Um, so Michelle, uh, I'm going to start with product person. Just say stop at any time. Stop. All right, right here. And, and we lock it in. And the last is builder, the person who can deliver one. So we're just going through checking candidates. Say stop anytime, Michelle. I don't know, I'm a little nervous. Stop. Right here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I didn't bring a 20. This is actually a hundred dollars. This is a big decision. I hope you got that one right, uh, Michelle. So, so what we've done is out of all of these different candidates, we've stopped at various places. We've chosen candidates. This is the most important thing for the company. If you have a VC, uh, they're going to look at the team that you've chosen, probably even more than the idea. And we've chosen four different uh, candidates out of all these different possibilities. So let's see how we did. For each skill, we're looking for that ace, that, that number one person in the world, top ace. So for visionary, the first one, we chose this candidate, the ace of diamonds. The, the, the visionary is someone who sees the long road and uh, can know how to get to the golden diamonds at the end. But I, I actually did the very first one, so maybe that's not that impressive, but uh, Ariel and Michelle, you chose randomly uh, all the others. So marketeer, Ariel, you chose an ace, Ariel. number one person. And the marketeer is the person who makes you fall in love with the idea. <laughs> so you chose the only person in the entire deck that could have been the perfect candidate for the marketeer skill. Okay. Now for product, uh, Michelle, I think you chose this one and you chose an ace. Now the product person, it's all about choosing the one, the two, the three. What's priority one? What's priority two, priority three? And that's why the ace of clubs is the only uh, card, the only candidate uh, among the deck. And finally, the most important, because it's sitting on $100, is 
is the builder and the builder digs with their spades every day to do the hard work to deliver the actual finished product. So fantastic job. You guys use your intuition, your chemistry of how that person feels uh, in order to make it work uh, perfectly for the team. So now that we have the, the right team, we have the right idea and why it's better, uh, we can now proceed to step three um, and the next lesson. Okay, so lesson three. We've gone, we have the idea, we've raised money. Um, here we are, got plenty of money. And now the whole challenge is about execution. And this is the most important step, right? Every day that you execute in your startup, once you've raised your money and you're, you're off and going, you need to produce more value than you spend. And in fact, you can count the number of days until you die by translating the money you have into your runway, right? Because every day you spend a certain amount uh, for salary, you spend a certain amount for office space. If you hire a new person, that shortens your runway, how much money and how much time you have left. So if you are not uh, executing well, you're not going to be successful as a startup. And so I'm going to teach you how to uh, make efficient decisions. And money equals the time until you die. Um, so again, my, uh, I had the pleasure of working with uh, Steve Jobs uh, for you know, about a year and a half until he died. Um, in fact, Siri launched October 4th, 2011, and Steve Jobs died the very next day. Um, and literally, here's something I have not spoken widely about. Uh, his executive admin contacted me and said, Steve Jobs was hanging on to life, clinging to life was the word she used, uh, to see Siri launch. That's how much he cared about uh, the Siri project. So one of the quotes that I enjoy from Steve the most is, people think focus means saying yes to the thing you've got to focus on, but that's not what it means at all. It means saying no to the hundred other good ideas that are out there. Innovation is saying no to a thousand things, right? And that's all about efficient decisions. If you have to pivot too many times, if you make the wrong choice of a co-founder, if you prioritize the wrong feature, you're going to waste time, you're going to run out of money, and you'll fall off a cliff, and it's over. Uh, so I have an exercise to help, help you practice and help teach you how to do this. Um, this is going to be based on my company, Viv Labs. Um, so Viv Labs was really a successor company to Siri. After Steve Jobs died, um, I couldn't pursue my vision um, at Apple. That's what I believed uh, because of some org changes. So I left and started a new company to continue the, the direction that I thought uh, conversational systems needed to go. I started a company. We actually were uh, called uh, Six Five Labs was the name of our company. And then we actually renamed uh, to Viv Labs later on. So this exercise uh, is based on Viv Lab. Uh, let me get it down here. So for this exercise, I don't need this anymore. We have some money, but it's not quite as big money. And we have some cards, but not the usual types of cards. Okay, we're going to need a volunteer uh, of some sort. Oops, we got a couple of these. So you can queue up someone if they're available to, to talk to us. Who would like to help with this, with this trick? Richard, can you jump in? Hey, Richard. Off. So Richard, just activate your mic. 
I did. I just saw the, the thing. How can I help? Awesome. Great. So what this exercise is going to be about is making efficient decisions. So as you see, we have 25 possible choices and every choice matters. So think of these choices as employees you might hire, uh, priorities that you might choose. But as Steve Jobs taught us, every time you make a decision, say you choose uh, number eight, you, you decide to go with candidate eight. Well, that means if you hire candidate eight, that means you're saying no to many other employees um, that uh, you could have chosen. If you prioritize a different feature, well, that means you're, you're not prioritizing all the different uh, features, the other features you could be working on. So uh, Richard, I've given you, I have five coins here. And what you need to do is make the perfect decision. And only one combination will be the efficient path to success. You make one mistake, the whole company will probably crumble. So the way this game is played is you choose any of the options and any option we choose will eliminate every other uh, candidate in its row and column, right? So you, get, you could choose 10, you could choose eight, you could, but in this row it'll entirely be gone if you chose 10 and this row will entirely be gone if you, uh, this column will be gone if you ch choose 10. So up to you, Richard. You need to make five choices, and they have to be the right choices. We need efficient decisions. One. One. All right. So I'm going to choose one here. Now, what? Make sure I do this right. That's going to eliminate every other candidate uh, in the row. And 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 Richard, you were so, uh, you know, quick and cavalier with your your uh, guess. Uh, you know, make sure to take time to think of the right ones. When you were talking, I was thinking. <laughs> All right, go ahead. We've got four more choices, okay. please. I, I trust you. Okay. The right team here. All right. Uh, 19. 19. All right. 19 means you did not choose 20. You did not choose 18, not choose 17. And you did not choose these. You chose 19. Okay. We've got a couple more choices. I'm going to choose. Seven. Seven. Seven's a lucky number. All right. Let's go with seven. So we eliminate these choices. Right now you're on a very diagonal path. I'm like that. Okay. I'm going to choose. I'll take that. 15? 15. Decided to not do diagonal. So that eliminates this one and this one. And 23. And that only leaves one final choice. Yep. 23. All right. Well, let's see how you did. So you chose 1, 7, 15, 19, and 23. Excellent. Now, Richard, you could have chosen any numbers prioritize any candidates or uh, any features, but these are the ones you chose. And I'm happy to announce that we chose the right co-founder because this is the exact choice that was needed to succeed and get to the next round of investment. So congratulations, Richard. Now you might say, wait, uh, maybe I, you know, I'm just saying that, but I, I can prove this is the only choice that would work. Now, first of all, let's, let's add these up real quick. So one and seven is eight, eight plus 15, 23, 23 plus 23 is 46 plus 19 is 65, 65. Well, if you look at these coins, I know they're hard to see. We actually have two quarters and three nickels. If we add that up, 50 plus 15, that's 65. So I foretold that if you had chosen, if you had chosen 24, it would have been a different number, right? But 65, in fact, more proof. If you look at our original slide, 
on that slide right here was 65. 65. Uh, and that's the sum, the number of cho that you chose. And if you get really uh, arcane and you look at Viv, Viv for Viv Labs, Viv in Roman numerals is VI is a six and V is five, six, five. So the, the, the exact numbers that you chose added up uh, to be the name of the company, Viv. Now, I, I'm sure you're going, okay, well, maybe some other combination of numbers uh, could have added up to 65. Like if I had chosen a two and a 22, that might have been 65 as well. Uh, but then uh, one thing I didn't tell you is that out of all the, the cards that you chose, they all had writing on the back. Let's take a look. Uh, some of them are companies. I see Facebook. I see Amazon, Apple. Uh, some of them are... Uh, um, actions like uh, goes out of business. I'm glad you didn't choose this card. <laughs> that was great. We had um, uh, sues. All right, we didn't sue for anybody or whatever. So there's there are companies, there are products like Alexa. So every card uh, has a number, and let's see what the the words that you chose. So behind number one. Six five lab. Behind number uh, seven, rebrand as. Fifteen, Viv Labs. So you're telling our story. We started out as six five lab. We rebranded as Viv Labs. Number nineteen was not. Sells to or Apple. Acquired by. And number 23, not Apple, not Google, not Facebook, but Samsung. So you chose exactly the right uh, numbers. That was really the, the game. Um, that we've been playing at Viv Labs, making the exact efficient right decision uh, all the way through. So thank you, Richard. That was uh, excellent decision excellent. making. Very good. Yeah, so, um, so with that kind of in conclusion, the three lessons that I'm teaching today is you need to have a differentiated idea, um, one that, that shows that, that's big and important addresses a big market uh, and, um, and that you can create a prototype for that's magical and shows why it's better than the competition. Lesson two, you need, you need help. You need the right founding team that covers four skills. There's the visionary who sees the long-term picture, the marketeer who can sell the vision to investors and customers. Uh, number three, um, you have the product person who can translate the vision into step one, step two, step three. And then the builder is the fourth skill who can deliver. So think about who you are, which one or one are you world class at? And then for the, for the others, you need to find people to help uh, who will complement your skills uh, to solve this. And then finally, with the right idea and the right team, you can raise money from venture capital or uh, seed investors or others, uh, and then the clock starts ticking. That money you've raised helps you the number of days until you die, and the secret to success is to make efficient decisions. Every decision matters because if you run out of money, you hit that cliff, you either, it's very challenging to raise money at a higher uh, rate of value if you have not produced enough value to get the next round of investment. So that's um, uh, three of my best lessons. And uh, now I'm opening for, uh, to questions in general. And thank you once again, the magic of entrepreneurship. And my name is Adam Chire. That was awesome. I have no idea how you thank did that. You. <laughs> <laughs> Just as great as I remembered being. I guess we'll probably have some questions coming in here. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? I was going to go ahead and just unmute everybody if they wanted to ask it verbally, or if you want to type it in the chat, you're welcome to do that as well. 
Yeah, thanks. I see a lot of different messages in the chat. I can't read them it's too far away, but. Uh, Sean Weehan has a question. I think you have to unmute him. Or Sean, can you unmute yourself? There we go. Oh my gosh, that was so good. We love yeah, that. Thank you. That was thank really you. entertaining and interesting. Um, in, in reg I mean, you know, obviously you're using the cards to describe Siri, but uh, was, is that a real true story? Did you actually use cards? Yeah. Uh, no, of course we didn't use real cards, but let me tell you the, the real story about this and it's quite close. So we walked into a VC meeting, an important VC meeting, and everyone, all the partners were there. And our CEO walked in and he threw down money onto the table. And of course, VCs love money, so they all sat up a little straighter. And he says, do, do any of you, this was 2007, 2008, do any of you have that shiny new iPhone that came out? And they were like, oh yeah, I've got one, I've got one. Do you have apps on that iPhone? Yeah, 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 I've got that. Do you have Google as one of those apps? Yes, great. We have money here. Whoever answers three questions in five minutes will be able to have the money. So get ready. And then our CEO and marketeer asked three normal questions that could come up in life. I'll give you an example of what one of them was. Your best customer uh, is coming into town tomorrow. He's staying at the um, Hilton Hotel and he loves Indian food. Make a reservation at the best rated Indian food restaurant within three miles of the Hilton Hotel. Now this was 2007. So they had open table, they had Yelp, they had maps, but there was no way to join it. They're like, oh, I, you know, open table doesn't have reviews. It can make reservations, but Yelp, what is the best? But I can't correspond it to the Hilton Hotel. And, and literally they're like, uh, 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 I can't go to websites. I can't go to apps. I can't join the information. And then our CEO pulls out a phone and says, hey, make a reservation tomorrow night at 7 p.m. for two people at the best Indian restaurant uh, within three miles of the Hilton Hotel. And boom, it was done. And so we had a software prototype, not cards. But what did we do there? We showed a prototype of a solution that was working that hit a pain point. We had to show people. They thought with Google, I can do anything. With apps and the smart one, I can do anything. Well, you can't do this and you might need to. Look how easy it is with Siri. Look how hard it is with the existing. And so that moment was when we were able to raise money, et cetera, because we were saying, why is our, our solution better than the competition? We, we surfaced a pain point they didn't even know they had until they walked into that room. And we gave them three three such questions, they basically, it was all about showing them there's lots of applicability. We can't do this today. They put their phones back in their pocket. They, like, they gave up. None of them could even do one question in five minutes. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Adam, we have a question that was submitted. Um, my question is how to effectively pitch to a potential customer or corporation uh, when your product is new and the customer is uneducated about it, and is it the novel, and it is in a novel emerging space? Uh, so what was the last part? So it's in a, a novel emerging space. So sure. It's so so believe me, in two thousand seven, Siri was a novel emerging space. There were no other conversational voice assistants. No one even knew they needed such a thing or they wouldn't really know what they would do with it uh, at the time. And so the story that I just gave is an example how to do that. You need to, um, you know, as I said multiple times, build a demonstration. You can't just talk about it. Build some prototype. And not everything was working in our first version of Siri and it wasn't ready to scale and it had problems too. But we had a working prototype that we could show and then we said, how can you do it today? What's the current best method? With Siri, we actually compiled uh, a number of, we did user studies where we brought in 30 or 40 people 
and we gave them 10 problems to solve that were, you know, normal everyday life kinds of things. We gave them, we, we let them measure how many clicks, how much time it took to answer the questions, how many of the questions they could do in half an hour. Um, using Google Mobile, uh, Ask Jeeves, which was popular in 2007, and Yahoo Local, which had a mobile experience. So we had three of the best competitors, and we, we said, here are the questions we're asking, here's how many clicks, how much time, and how successful 30 or 40 people were on answering these, these important everyday questions. And then with, with Siri, our Siri prototype, uh, here's how they were able to achieve. It saved this, this percent of clicks, this amount of, uh, it sped it up this amount of time, and the success rate was like, you know, way better. Um, so, so that's how we pitched an emerging new idea to customers who didn't know they needed it, and we quantified it. We did our own studies to prove that our method, if, if scaled and successful, would have real value that we could, we could show and quantify over the best competition uh, we could find in the commercial market. So, so that's how we did it. I hope, hope that answers your question. Awesome. We have another question from Julian. In both of your experiences, uh, e.g. Siri or Viv Labs, did you ever have the wrong founders to start with? How did you know and how did you change it? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I would say, you know, I, I didn't know much about entrepreneurship, if anything about entrepreneurship when I started. Uh, I actually started three companies at the same time because uh, I didn't know better. Uh, it turned out okay. So Siri was my day job. Sentient was my night job. Uh, Change.org was kind of a spin out. I had built the prototype. I was first developer at Change.org and built the first website. But then I transitioned it over to other developers once we had other developers <laughs> and moved out uh, of that. Um, so I've been pretty lucky. Um, along the way, uh, I've always built, you know, a network of people and I keep lists. There are not that many people who impress me or surprise me in a positive way. Uh, and when they do, I remember it. So that was a big help in uh, finding co-founders. So, um, you know, I, I remember like technical, I'm, I'm a tech guy and I can sort of estimate how long a task might be done what are the different methods and it's but i'm i'm always overly uh positive so if i say it's going to take two weeks in reality it'll probably take three weeks there are a few times when i said it's going to take two weeks and someone gives it back in three days and i'm like what just happened i write them down on my list for that skill set and i keep these lists uh, so siri uh we had three co-founders so Doug Kitlaus was our marketeer. Tom Gruber uh, really helped on product um, and design. He was our VP of design. I was sort of visionary and builder. Um, and you know, we we when you when you get co-founders, you spend more time together perhaps than with your family. So it's really important you can get along and work well. Well, Tom, Doug, and I, uh, I'm a pretty quiet person there were times we'd go into an office and we thought the roof was going to be blowing out uh, off the building we, we we fought we shouted we you know we were so passionate and there was so much tension but we never left let it affect us on a personal level we'd walk out and it was gone and done for and that fighting and tension which was kind of surprising uh, i think the original theory app that we came out with was one of the best things I've ever done in my career. Uh, Steve Wozniak, the co-founder uh, of Apple, along with Steve Jobs, said it's his favorite app of all time. Not the Siri that's in our iPhones, but the original Siri app that was launched as a free app in the App Store. And it was because we had great chemistry. Uh, in some of the other companies, I, I won't name names or companies, we had not really founders, but early, early employees um, that didn't work out 
uh, perfectly. Um, sometimes we adjusted um, the way we worked with them and managed to, to keep, keep the relationship good. And others, we had early, early people that, you know, not, luckily not co-founders, we, we had early employees that we actually decided to go in a different direction and, and, and separated uh, amicably. Um, so I guess I've been lucky in my four companies, um, really uh, three, three I was co-founder of, uh, Change.org, I'm just a founding member and first developer. Uh, there was only one real founder, which was Ben Rattray the CEO and, and founder. Um, so yeah, you know, you, it, if you have, if you choose the wrong person as a co-founder, it's, it's a real mess, which is why I try to emphasize how important it is when you're evaluating candidates. You know, you really have to choose the right one. It's probably the most important decision in the company. I, I had one, one last comment on co-founders. I remember one startup who said, okay, we have four co-founders. I'm like, oh, that's a lot, but okay. Who are they? What do they do? Oh, we're all designers. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> it's the worst idea I've ever heard. Love designers. You need design. Um, but you don't want four of the same person. You want a varied, rich set of skills that covers uh, those four key areas I talked about. So thank you for your question. Awesome. We have another one from John who asked, how did you get that first meeting? I'm guessing with Apple. Uh, we have a hardware medical device that collects data for software predictive analytics for opioid overdoses. This is an upgrade to a child resistant cap. Mm -hmm. um, so we, you know, we, we were launching a free app with Siri. We were launching a free app in the app store. Um, but we did, you know, the app store people, they, you, you get assigned a person when you launch an app who tries to help, um, you know, your app be successful and advocate it. And one thing that we did, which was, uh, I think, really compelling, even before our app launched officially, we prepared a video demo of our app, what it, running on an iPhone, you know, kind of a development version. And we sent it through that app store contact point uh, to Apple. And he helped schedule a little meeting um, early, early on before we were launched, um, uh, where we kind of came in and just said, hi, you know, we're building an app for your, for your product. Uh, it's really cool. We, get, we actually got to meet a few people and we, we made sure to leave behind that, that kind of short, compelling video demonstration, right? You need a magical demonstration of what you do. We left a video of that and we hoped and thought that this might get passed around the company. People saying, hey, have you seen this? This could be good. Let me forward this link to what have you. So we had a private link to a video that I think was uh, tantamount. So we got, um, uh, it got passed, I think, around uh, the company. And so it created a little internal buzz. And then when the app launched, there were a bunch of uh, people who downloaded it from Apple. I remember Greg Christie, who ran um, HI, which is human interfaces at Apple. He said, I was the first person to download it because I had heard about it and wanted to see it. Um, and then literally two or three weeks after we launched, uh, our phone rang. We had an iPhone, no physical phone. You know, remember when uh, iPhones, you'd have to swipe to answer them and sometimes it didn't swipe right. So we saw the phone ringing. It says, Apple, Cupertino, we're swiping. Didn't swipe. We, we, finally it answers and we hear, hey, it's Steve. Steve Jobs, what you doing? And we're like, Steve Jobs is calling us at, you know, on our phones. Um, and he goes, yeah, what you doing? Want to come over to my house tomorrow? Uh, the three co-founders went to his house. We spent three hours talking about the future. He made it clear he wanted to buy the company. Uh, we said, we're not interested. Thank you. We're flattered. Uh, but goodbye. And we left. And uh, that was almost the end of the story. But then he and Scott Forstall came back about a month later um, and discussion started again. So we, we never really had a first meeting per se. We did have, we, we passed the video 
We did have a small internal meeting at Apple with no one really interesting, but we had leave behind video that told our story in a compelling way that we think got passed around Apple and ultimately Steve called us himself. Wow, that's a pretty amazing story. <laughs> Thank you. So I have another question from Van. How did you qualify the initial questions during customer development as important and every day? Um, we had done some user testing, um, as I had mentioned early, and so we were looking at, you know, what are people doing, especially on mobile, because we knew this would be best as a mobile solution. Um, so we were looking at different domains and, and trying to, you know, kind of do the normal things of, of having different profiles of people that we wanted, you know, like the, the young urban professional who's mobile and blah, 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 travels a lot and, you know, between these ages. And then there's this other persona who's going to have these. So we, we did sort of traditional product marketing kind of research. Um, and then we, you know, did brainstorming sessions, very product oriented, where we'd have the sticky notes and people would ask, what would you want to be able to say to such an assistant? And we looked at the different brands who were out there, because ultimately, for me, Siri was and Viv is um, an, a new interface, a new kind of interface to everything. It should really be like a web browser or a smartphone. Um, so we, we didn't want to build an assistant that could do anything in particular. We wanted to build uh, an assistant like a web browser that every business in the world could themselves build a website, build an app, or build a Siri interface, or build a Viv interface. We never made that happen at Apple, but now Viv and Samsung, uh, you can go to BixbyDevelopers.com and download the best development tools anywhere. Um, uh, to be able to make a conversational interface into your service or content, publish it in an app store like Marketplace, uh, and have it discovered by users across Samsung devices. And Samsung has more than a billion devices, TVs, smartphones, refrigerators. Uh, they acquired Harman, the speaker company, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the, that's always been the case, that it did matter for the demos what uh, use cases we used. Um, and we, we, we did the traditional marketing things. We looked at partners and what capabilities, who would we want to use. Um, but that's, that's uh, basically the approach. But long term, we didn't really care what the use case was. We see it as a very horizontal kind of capability. Awesome. Uh, another question from Steve. What are your thoughts on the future of voice and voice first applications? What does the world of voice enabled interaction look like in five to 10 years? Sure. Um, so it really is continuing what I had just said, which is today, um, you know, people have Alexa, they have Siri, Google, whatever, um, but they don't use it for much. And the reason is 97 or so percent of traffic um, to these assistants are the built-in commands uh, and even ecosystems like Alexa where they have a hundred thousand they call them skills where companies can plug in nobody uses those skills because no one has solved discovery yet um, and you still have to use name dispatch to keywords to trigger a specific skill so you'd say Alexa ask app 7 to do command 5 well with a hundred thousand skills I can't remember 100,000 different, um, you know, command names and, you know, product names and command sets. It's, it's not scalable. Um, so in what I've been trying to do with VidLabs and, and through Bixby is to make a scalable ecosystem that is not about what comes out of the box, but it's about discovery and exploring all of the capabilities from hundreds and thousands of partners. Uh, I want to create something that every connected user and every connected business drives significant value through every single day. Um, so just like if I were to say, you can't use a web browser or a smartphone for the next week, you'd be like, ah, how do I function? But if I said you can't use, 
your favorite assistant for the next week, you'd be like, ah, eh, inconvenient. So the assistant today is utility. I see a time when a conversational experience um, is as, as important and maybe more important than the web or mobile, um, not only because of the voice access, but the ability to combine information across different services, just like we gave in our very first demo on the table, get me a, you know, make a reservation at the best rated from Yelp hotel, uh, you know, a restaurant that serves lasagna uh, near the Google Maps Hilton Hotel, things like that. It's, it's combining and working with information and transactions and helping decisions um, in a way that can't easily be done on the web or mobile today. So that's where I would like to see uh, voice. It's, it's starting today. Um, you can, you know, there are some, the Bixby ecosystem, I think is the most interesting one in the market yet today, even though Bixby as an assistant is not well known um, yet. Um, but I think those ideas will get out into the other assistants and, and voice as an interface medium will have, will, will change everything. Just like when the web came out, just when mobile came out, when the assistant becomes scalable, um, to every business and every industry, it'll change everything. All right, so I know we're a little bit over, so I, you've been getting tons of questions, but I'm gonna wrap it up with our last question. Um, sure. And if anybody has additional ones later, you can reach out to me and I'll see if I can get those to you, Adam. If Siri was initially a free app, what was your revenue model? Yeah, so we, we basically use kind of an affiliate model which is the, the pitch was we were lowering the bar um, to creating not only actions, but transactions um, in mobile. So instead of, you know, at the time when the iPhone came out, the screen was small. It was hard to type on a keyboard because it's so small on the iPhone. Each click or round trip was like on 3G was like 30 to 45 seconds or more. Um, so to get through a transactional flow and buy something or do something was incredibly painful. But if you could in one step say, buy me uh, two tickets to the Iron Man movie this weekend, and it said, here they are at this theater, it's the closest to you. And you say, yep, click, and it's done in like one step. Man, that's way better, et cetera. So what we did was we would drive transactions to parties. Uh, at the time, we used to get paid a dollar every time we sent a reservation to OpenTable. Uh, we got paid 15% uh, commission or affiliate fee revenue um, uh, for attractions, tourist attractions, like, you know, take a helicopter ride and over Las Vegas. If you said that through Siri, we would get 15%. Uh, and we were getting, we would get $60 on a $300 hotel reservation. Um, if you just booked, find me a, you know, a nice hotel for uh, two people with a queen bed uh, and a swimming pool and that allows pets. Oh, could you do it less than $200? Um, oh, and, and remember that I like, uh, I have Marriott points. And you would do those kinds of things. You could book faster and easier. Um, and then we would get affiliate fee revenues, um, some of them quite substantial. That makes a lot of sense. So you didn't initially expect to be acquired by Apple? Oh, no. I, as I said, we met Steve, which was cool. He gave us the offer, uh, but we, we're, we said, we're not interested. Acquisition was not in our plan. Um, we had actually signed uh, one of the largest mobile distribution deals ever with uh, a carrier who was going to put us on every device, not only iPhone, but Blackberries, Android, Above the fold, we were gonna be a preloaded app everywhere with primetime TV commercials and billboards. It was a huge deal. Um, and so we were gonna go out and grow that way. Um, so the acquisition was uh, unexpected, but in the end, I think, you know, you have to make efficient decisions. So I think we, we chose the right, the right decision. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Adam, for uh, this amazing magic show presentation and for <laughs> thank you so answering much. everyone's questions. And um, anybody who has any follow up, reach out to me. I'm happy to help any way I can. And yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate thank it. You.
Bye. Bye. And I don't think my recording works. So if you could send me the recording afterwards, uh, I'd love that. Will do. Okay, thanks. Bye.